All right. Well, today for our Ask an NMU alum video chat, we have Dr. Veronica Howard with us. Um, she is an NMU alum, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about how she got to where she is, what she's doing now, and um, why she chose that route. So thanks so much for being with us. I know you're in Alaska, and your time zone is, you're what, four hours different, right? We, yeah, I think we're four hours behind. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks for taking some time out of your day. Um, tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. So I am a faculty member at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And so it's a school that's actually very much like NMU. In fact, they even have the same school colors. And it's kind of a small teaching college. The primary focus there is on the students and, and faculty um, support for students and a lot of emphasis on teaching, high quality teaching. And I'm also what's called a board certified behavior analyst. So that means that I have uh, advanced training in applied behavior analysis, which is sort of the more scientific approach to understanding human behavior and why people choose to do what they do. And some of my areas of specialty there are staff training and distance education, as well as improving challenging behaviors for folks who are diagnosed with developmental disabilities. All right, that sounds Kind of amazing. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about what helped you decide what degree to pursue. Um, you were a psychology major when you were here at Northern, correct? I was actually a criminal justice major and oh. a psychology major slash, because at the time you had the psychology major and you could emphasize, but now I think there are like different tracks within the psychology department. So I was criminal justice and psychology slash behavior analysis. Right. So I was always a behavior analyst. Mm -hmm. um, but I honestly thought at the time, right, because I, I graduated in 2005 and I was convinced through this really, I had a really great education that what I originally wanted to do was be a criminal profiler. Right. Like I want to be those folks on criminal minds and I want to go mm -hmm. you know, analyze crime scenes and figure out why people are doing what they're doing and try to figure that out so I can catch people. And unfortunately, it became very clear to me through my tenure as an undergrad, uh, that I was not well suited for the FBI. So I was like, fine, I, I can see that I am not very well suited for the FBI. So I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna go over here to the psychology department where they're like really great professors and they really sort of supported what it was that I was interested in. And once criminal profiling was sort of off the plate, it very much was focused on what are some ways that we can help people who, for you know, lack of a better expression, <clears throat> are kind of sassy, right? So you've got the kids who are adjudicated out of their home. They're, they're not living with their parents. They're in group homes uh, by virtue of maybe some criminal behavior or some other form of misbehavior. So their behavior is really challenging. They're aggressive or they're uh, disruptive to the home environment. They're dangerous to be in their home with their family. So what are some things that we can do for them to make sure that they're well supported both in their treatment setting, but also to sort of improve the quality of services they're getting so they can go home faster? Or if they do go home, how do we support their family and better understanding how to you know, support them. They didn't get here by surprise. It wasn't like, you know, Timmy was fine one day and then now he's the devil. Mm -hmm. Like it's a slow progression into more and more extreme forms of behavior. So that once profiling was off the table, I'm like, well, this, you know, if we can solve the problem before it ever gets to, to real criminality, then that, that seems like a really good strategy. So during my time as an undergraduate, especially in my last year or so, I spent a lot of time in internships and in volunteering in lots of different places and figuring out, you know, what are my interests and how do my interests align with some of the different opportunities out there? And I was absolutely convinced as an undergraduate that, okay, can't be a criminal profiler. So, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a better group home. I'm going to make sure that the group homes that people are going to are, are well staffed and the staff are well trained and that they're delivering the the program correctly and the kids are going to have the best time. And, and to do that though, I discovered that I, I needed to get some advanced training. I took a year off between getting my uh, bachelor of science in 2005 and I needed a, a little bit of time because I had some pretty significant debt by that point. And I moved to kind of a rural 
<clears throat> Midwest state and actually spent time working with young men who had um, substance abuse disorders. And again, were adjudicated out of their home. So they're by court order, they're removed and they're in substance treatment, sometimes poly substance treatment, meaning that they've been using a lot of different chemicals, but they're also kind of a pain in the butt. Like their, their behavior is not, this is high functioning Steve and he's great, except sometimes he does math. This is, you know, this is Jamal. And in addition to smoking pot every day and drinking, he's also running from the police. So what can we do to help support, you know, Jamal and Steve and Scott and whoever. Mm -hmm. But it was really terrible because you could see this big disconnect between, you know, the frontline staff, which was me at the time, and the clinical treatment staff. So the folks who sort of led the treatment team. And it was, the disconnect was so large that very often, if you think of it like hands, the left hand, the treatment team, uh, wasn't really communicating with the right hand to tell them what to do. And the behavior change programs, again, this is going back to behavior analysis, talking about how contingencies or the environment supports behavior, those contingencies that were put into place to help improve behavior weren't being implemented. Or if they were being implemented, some folks would be implementing the, the program, right? You earn points for this and you lose points for that and you can trade your points for rewards and doing fun stuff. Uh, some folks would, would use the program both good and bad, meaning you've earned points, but oh man, that's a racial slur, so you just lost a lot of points. Uh, and some folks weren't at all, right? Mm -hmm. They took a more holistic approach to treatment, but it, it really didn't change behavior. So there's a lot of different variability in how treatment was being delivered. And as a result, we would have a lot of folks who would leave treatment, no better, right? But they had technically graduated because they had been there for the amount of time that was necessary for them to be in treatment. Mm -hmm. And they'd leave and they'd come back in two months. You know, and after a few months, I'm like, I I'm I can see what the problem is, but I'm just a frontline staff member and nobody's listening to me that this is mm -hmm. a problem. You know what I need to be? I need to be a doctor. <laughs> so I was like, okay, grad school it is. Um, so I was really fortunate then to be able to go on to <clears throat> pardon me, the University of Kansas, which is one of the oldest and, and one of the most esteemed you know, programs in behavior analysis and worked with just some amazing people to learn the things that I know now. Mm -hmm. That is a really compelling story. <laughs> um, so you were talking, um, kind of going back to your undergrad, I know this isn't something that we talked about before, but you mentioned that you had done some internships and internships are kind of a hot topic on campus right now. Yeah. Um, we're trying to help students understand that getting that on the job experience early can really benefit them later. So can right. you talk a little bit about your internship experience as an undergrad? You know, how did you find that position? Um, and you know, how do you feel like that really helped you cement where you wanted to be and where you wanted to go? I have found from two perspectives, like as an, an undergraduate myself and now as a faculty member who supports students in their internship, mm -hmm. that it is probably one of the most valuable experiences that I could have ever had. So my treatment locations, my settings where I did my internships, I think I was at three different organizations in and around Marquette, one of which was a group home. And this was like the group home for kids who were really troubled. These were very challenging behaviors, multiple DSM diagnoses, the 13 year old girl who will put you through a wall when you tell her no. So that type of group home with young troubled kids, uh, some time working sort of in HR and training, and then a third internship working in a sex offender rehabilitation clinic right? Again, coming back from that perspective of, well, if we're talking about criminal behavior, and actually that's an axe I can grab for a very long time, but if we're talking about criminal behavior, why do people get there? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, one of the clients that, <clears throat> one of the most surprising clients I ever read a case file for was a person who had, um, on many, many occasions, been caught uh, not clothed enough in public, in very public places, but in ways that were like, oh, surprise, right? Like, and I just remember reading this file and going, why would you ever, I, I can't, 
can't. <laughs> and I imagine that if I had had that same experience, if I had come across, let's just call him Steve, right? Because every client's name is Steve. Mm -hmm. If if I had come across Steve's file and I was already graduated, I would probably have read it and been like, geez, some people are just weird. But having that internship net not only gave me that experience under very low stakes conditions, because then I'm in these places that otherwise would not have taken me, like they would not have paid me to be there. Sure. They probably wouldn't have even let me volunteer there, mm -hmm. but they let me intern there, right? Because it's an educational opportunity. And they, give, they gave me different things that I could do because it was educational, because they sort of wanted to give that back. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only did I have access to these very strange and unusual circumstances that I probably never would have unless I had gone to graduate school, unless I was a graduate student, mm -hmm. but I also had people to come back to talk about them with. Mm -hmm. And not only did I have folks to sort of decompress or talk through these very unusual cases or these really challenging uh, scenarios with, but I was uniquely privileged and the person who was supervising my internship was actually from a different sort of discipline or approach. So like I said, behavior analyst, right? Very scientific, very objective, but prone to being kind of judgy, right? Behavior analysts can be a little bit holier than that. Like, well, you know the contingencies, why don't you just do the thing? But coming from it at another perspective, and this was, um, Mary Pelton Cooper, who used to be in the psych department. I'm, I'm not sure if she's still. I think she still is. Yeah. Yeah. So coming at it from her perspective, which is much more holistic and much more sort of supportive. And, you know, let's think through phenomenologically why a person might do that. And this very soft kid glove approach to, well, let's think about that. Let's unpack that a little bit really forced me to come at this from a different perspective, to like really consider the ways in which, well, how would your environment support you engaging in this behavior that otherwise is just bizarre? Like mm -hmm. I, I can't even describe, and, and the problem is I can't even tell you like what the behavior is because of the confidentiality, but sure. it's like, <laughs> but you take it from that perspective of this kind of like low stakes, thankfully not predatory mm -hmm. um, kind of self-exposure behavior. And you can see how it does apply to things that are a little bit more predatory or um, situations in which a person's criminal behavior really does harm other people, but it might be the only way that they can meet a particular need. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that. And so you had three separate internships. I think that that's really incredible. Like yeah. a wide range of experiences that you were able to to get that you, like you said, you probably wouldn't have been able to get anywhere in mm -hmm. anything else um, other than grad school later. Yeah. Well, and in, in my time, I'm not sure if it's still the, the way, but they had this sort of uh, flat rate tuition situation. Mm -hmm. Is that still the um, I believe so. It's a, up to 16 credits right now. So yeah. oh. <laughs> I am so sorry for anyone watching because I may have been one of the reasons why now it's only 16 because at the time it was like flat rate tuition, take as much as you want. Mm -hmm. so I would, there were semesters where I was taking like 22 credits. It was mm -hmm. crazy. And I would get to the end where it's like, well, I don't have all of my stuff. So I could pay this much and take eight credits or I could just pay a little bit more and take 16. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take 16 and get all these different, like, I'm going to mm -hmm. take photography and I'm going to take this class and I'm going to go over here and take whatever and, and two internships and mm -hmm. sorry about it. No, <laughs> but you took a wide range of, you went outside of psychology and criminal justice and experienced some other classes. Yes. Well, in fact, I did have to because I was also an honor student. Mm -hmm. So at the time you, you had that kind of, uh, early education so in the preparatory time when you're getting all your general education courses, mm -hmm. I had sort of clept or tested out of those. And so I didn't have to take English or early math or anything of that sort. So I was left with all of these extra credits that I couldn't really do anything with, but thankfully the, the honors program was available. So instead of taking, you know, technical writing, I could take French literature from 1400 to 1700, because that's going to be you know, super useful. <laughs> But in retrospect, it actually was pretty useful because you take these crazy courses and you can't, there's no way you can know at the time, like, huh, you know, knowing 
the dynamic between the Marquis de Sade's writing and the, the principles that followed before and after really helps highlight the ways in which our culture goes from one extreme to the other in transit. It, it, but there's no way you can know that at the time. You're like, why are you making me read Madame de Clèves? This is dumb. <laughs> I, I'm a firm believer that there is a huge element of chaos in any career development. And so kind of embracing that is key. Um, you also kind of working up your educational ladder, I guess. So then after um, undergrad, you went on to grad school. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our students are considering grad school and, and, you know, that prospect is a little bit daunting. Can you talk a little bit about the, the application process or how you decided to um, go to Kansas? You know, can you talk a little bit about your grad school experience, I guess? Yes, absolutely. So when I was getting to the quote, to the end of my, my undergraduate career, I had this sort of moment of panic, sort of right around now, actually, between October and January, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm a senior, and I don't really know what it is that I'm going to do, right? And I just, I, I'm apoplectic with this fear that I've done all this time, and I've spent all this money, and I have no idea where I'm going to go or what I'm going to do, or this is what I'm interested in, but I can't really do that. And, and, ah, uh. so I went to my advisor at the time and he just asked me very simply, he's like, what is it that you're interested in? And I was like, you know, what really gets my goat because all of my interests are framed from this perspective of, you know, what makes me really angry <laughs> to code for, you know what I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. and, and that was it. It was finding a thing that really sort of stuck with me, the thing that, that popped into my head and I didn't mean for it to. And at the time it was this darn placement. I'm in this placement where uh, we've got these kids with this problem behavior and the staff aren't doing the programs. Why are the staff not doing the programs? And then they're saying the programs don't work. And so we're doing these different things or we're being more intrusive than we need to with the clients, but we're not seeing any improvement in behavior. So then we become even more intrusive and then the clients are even less happy and they make less. What? Why don't they just do their jobs? And my advisor said, it sounds like you need to go to grad school. Like, it sounds like if you want to improve this, if you want to make a better group home, you need to go to grad school. So he said, the place you need to go for this is where group home started, which was achievement place in Kansas. And so that's why the University of Kansas. But again, I had that, that off year because financially I just couldn't afford to go immediately from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I wasn't, I wasn't really prepared for the transition for, from undergraduate to graduate. And even in retrospect now, I recognize that when I look at the career trajectories of my peers, who are also board certified behavior analysts, that many of them, if they went to graduate school, they had a lot of graduate school preparation. So mm -hmm. they were reaching out and they had become really educated about how graduate school works. And I had not done the same. And it really has sort of left a lasting impression on me. So when I'm working with my own students now and they're kind of struggling with, well, do I want to go to grad school or do I not? The first question I ask is, how, what do you want to do? What makes you passionate? Just like my advisor asked me, but if you're saying that you want to go to grad school because you don't know what to do, that's the wrong reason. If you're saying that you want to go to grad school because you want people to call you doctor, that is also the wrong reason. I mean, there are many careers like music producer where people will call you doctor, right? Sure. So if you want to get into bed, right, if you want to commit to graduate education, you have to recognize that it's a lot of time and it's a lot, a lot of money. And if you're not certain that you're really passionate enough about it, that you will sacrifice three or four years for a master's degree or six to eight now for a doctorate, if, if you hear those numbers and you're like, then take time off, right? Go do something. Go, you could go to the AmeriCorps. You could go volunteer in a foreign country. You could just work at a local placement. You can see what 
what strikes your fancy and what doesn't, mm -hmm. but don't commit because I've seen folks who go through their, their three or four years in graduate, like master's degree to become counselors and they hate people. <laughs> so it's like, why do you want a job where you're going to listen to nothing but people complain all day and it just makes you angry. Maybe, maybe let's like try different things. Let's see what works. Mm -hmm. And there's no recipe, like there's no recipe for success. Graduate school for one person is not going to be uh, the way that everyone needs to go. So it's really challenging and you always kind of wonder about the path that you didn't take, but knowing what's in store for you can be helpful because I think I would have probably made some different choices if I had been prepared for how graduate school typically goes. Right. It certainly would have led to a shorter tenure in graduate school. I probably wouldn't have spent as long as I did if I sort of knew the game. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Um, all right. So kind of followed you all the way through undergrad, graduate. Um, and so now you are a faculty member at um, the University of Alaska. So tell me a little bit more about, you know, what it is you're doing now. Um, you know, what does a typical work day or work week look like for you? Well, the thing about a faculty position is, I think a lot of folks think it's maybe just the lecturing, right? So when I was an undergrad, I would see, uh, for example, my professor twice a week for an hour, hour and a half, and I would think, oh, well, that that's a pretty sweet gig, right? Because I see you twice a week, that's three hours. If you have like four classes, that's 12 hours, three, four, 12, yeah. Um, that's a pretty awesome, that's that's a good job, right? Mm -hmm. And it just seems so casual because they're up there and they're like, here's all the knowledge I'm gonna share with you today. Um, it seemed very calm, very relaxed. I had no idea what goes on behind the scenes, like none whatsoever. And I imagine it's probably the same for every job. Right, like we we see from our perspective, this is what the job looks like, but we don't see how the sausage is made. We don't see anything that happens behind the scenes. So, yeah, I I do in a typical week lecture about twelve hours, and then I grade about twelve to fifteen hours, and then I attend meetings for another. I can't even articulate the number of meetings that I attend. But I also get to do really amazing things like advising undergraduates. So I, I advise a student club and they put together events for campus, like educational opportunities or training events or sometimes just social events. Um, I also serve on the board of a couple of local agencies. So talking about things like how do we increase the opportunities for folks in my field in the area training and support and things of that sort or how can we bring in more resources so that the clients of this agency are better served how do we fundraise or how do we maybe get folks who are toward the end of their life to leave some of their their inheritance to an organization that really helps serve their family for a long time and on top of that I also get to do research and some of my areas of research, like I said, are staff training and support the efficacy of education. So what are some things that work well and what are some things that don't? And then recently I've been getting into um, open education and this idea that we can really help improve the educational process from kindergarten through graduate school if the materials that you need to learn are freely available. Right? So your textbooks are free and you have all these really great, robust materials that you can look at to use and, and getting into, well, what happens if I adopt these for this class? And then what happens when I adopt these for this class? And are the, are the student performance levels, are they the same? Are students happier? Do they, how much money are we saving if, if students don't have to buy a $150 textbook that they'll only use once? Mm -hmm. So on a Typical day, it can be pretty challenging. So days like my Monday are sometimes 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. only because I have three classes on a day. But there are other days like today where my primary focus is I'm going to do a lot of grading and a lot of class prep, and I'm going to do um, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for giving up some of that time on your Tuesday. Um, okay, so 
you know, going back a little bit, I realized we talked about, we talked about your schooling and then you were talking about what it's like to work at the university. How did you end up um, working at the university in the first place? You know, you were talking about uh, wanting to make uh, processes better and make a better group home. How did you get from there to teaching? So during my time in graduate school, Again, still super convinced that I'm going to make a better group home. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got to graduate school, I didn't get an internship working in group homes. Like I, my first focus was taking some prerequisite classes and learning more about this field that I'm, I'm going to be studying for, I guess, the rest of my life. And through that process, I was a teaching assistant for my advisor in this course. And it started sort of getting under my skin that my advisor was a very, very sweet man. Um, hadn't updated his course materials since probably before I was born. And he was a very, very old man. So you can imagine the sorts of things that would be appropriate educational materials in times before political correctness. Uh, or language that we would maybe use before, like the term uh, developmental disability is a new term. Mm -hmm. And we have adopted it because the older terms that we used to use to refer to an individual who's diagnosed with a developmental disability are not appropriate anymore. But his textbook hadn't caught up yet, oh, right? No. It was his own textbook. And, um, and he didn't sort of buy into the political correctness machine. So he's like, well, MR is MR. So I don't need to update it so that it's more socially appropriate. And instead, students will just have to experience the consequences of saying retardation when they get to their placements. But then at the same time, like you're, you're not really preparing people for honoring their clients, like respecting their clients, seeing them as people, mm -hmm. not a diagnosis. Uh, and so there were some problems with that and there, there was a lot of student dissatisfaction. I mean, my advisor had the, the poorest ratings, the lowest ratings in the entire department, but he had sort of, he had sort of checked out by that time. So I was like, you know what, we can fix this. And that's, that's the other thing about behavior analysts is everything is a nail and we are hammers. So it's like, oh, this is a thing we could do. Let's troubleshoot this. Let's fix this problem. And I discovered that when I started doing some lectures in class, I was like, oh, this is literally the best. This is the most fun thing that I have ever done in my life. And it seemed to go over pretty well. Like the material was received as well or better than it had been before. I enjoyed it. And I realized this was, this was very much my jam. This was for me. Um, so in addition to you know, doing the work of a faculty member, I can still, through service or research, do a lot of the community-based interventions that I would otherwise have done. But being a faculty member and having to do these things as part of my, what's called my workload or as part of my contract, it actually gives me the freedom to sort of do the other things for free. So it allows me to sort of give back to the community in a way that keeps me solvent keeps me financially viable. Mm -hmm. I can volunteer, you know, 15, 20 hours a week of my time to an organization who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford the, the you know, hundred to $200 an hour that my people or my profession would charge, but I can give it to them for free. Mm -hmm. And then I can take the materials that I create and I can give those away again for free. So it's, it's kind of a sweet gig. I, yeah, that sounds pretty awesome to me. Um, I like that you, you know, are not only, you've recognized that you really enjoy teaching and that's kind of what you're passionate about and you have the subject matter that you enjoy teaching. And then you also kind of bring that community involvement in, you know, so that's, that's really, I think, helpful for students to know that it's not just what you're doing as a, you know, for a living, for a paycheck, but you can also get some of that satisfaction you know, outside of your paycheck, which I think is important for them to know. Um, so with all of those different factors, what is, you know, what do you like best about what you do? What's your favorite part about? You know, we, we say these things, we tell people, 
stuff that I think is probably good advice. These, these expressions that you hear, like, if you really love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life or, uh, you know, follow your passion and do what, what's really interesting to you. As you were resummarizing the things that I had just said, I, I don't know that I've ever put it in the perspective that I managed to find a way to do the things that I enjoy, but pay for them doing the other things that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. right? And it's kind of a unique opportunity. And I was sort of thinking, well, as you're summarizing, I was having this sort of private behaviors thought pattern where I'm like, well, everyone should do this, right? Like this is what we should be telling. <clears throat> we should be telling all, all graduating undergrads, like just do what you're passionate about. I like follow Dr. Howard's lead and go do what you're passionate about. But there certainly are costs associated with some of these things. And, and I think going back to this issue of how do you prepare yourself for the world? There are going to be times, especially in our current economic, economic climate, unfortunately, where we don't have the freedom to do the things that, that we would love to do, or we're really well trained to do you know, X, but by virtue of, of taking care of yourself or your family, you have to do Y. Um, but if you can find a way so that what you have to do helps lead you closer to what you want to do, or if you can incorporate things of like what you want to do into what you have to do to be, uh, you know, financially stable, I think it's the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that I love most about being a faculty member is that I mean sometimes there really are some some hard truths like we tell people if you get a college education and you do well and you get an internship then you will be successful right you have 100% uh, likelihood of having the dream but it's unfortunately it's not true and sometimes for some people, it's going to take a little bit longer to get to where they want to than it might otherwise have taken. So recognizing that this advice that, that we're programmed to give, right? This is the party line. If you study and you do well and you go to college, you're going to be successful. It kind of comes from a position of privilege and recognizing that you have a good potential. This increases the likelihood that you will be successful. But if you graduate, maybe it takes a few years to find that thing that works for you. Or you graduate and you start doing the thing that you think that you love and you hate it. And that's okay too, right? And like you can learn through examples, but you can also learn through non-examples. And this is a situation where it's like, oh, that is a non-example career for me. Uh, but I think being open to the possibility and as a faculty member being, oh, I have the privilege where I can be like, you know what? I'm not really interested in this anymore. So now I'm going to drop everything and go do that, um, which is very nice. It also allows me to find other people, specifically undergraduates, who are interested in stuff that I wouldn't have even thought of, right? So I have a particular set of skills and I also have a particular set of interests. So I do a lot of web-based training or education or I'm like, how do I figure out how to incorporate video games into my research? Like, what am I going to do? How do I, how can I make Minecraft a thing? <laughs> and it's, it's not impossible to find other people if you just sort of put it out there to find other people who are like, oh, what a great idea. Let's make Minecraft a thing. And then you can together do a project. So I'm really privileged because I can, I'm around all these people who are like, I'm an undergraduate and I want these experiences. And I'm like, great, because I'm a faculty member and I've got resources. Let's get together. Uh, but in a non-Title IX violating way. Let's do research together. Let's figure out how we can make people really hate Minecraft or really love Minecraft. Uh, so it, it's kind of a, it's a great job, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not for everybody. So I have other colleagues, right, who are very close to me, who you would imagine that, we're almost identical people because we have the same career path. We have the same title. We have, we're both from the same school. She also lives up here and I, she specializes in, in treating children diagnosed with autism. And she came and taught a class, like a single semester class, was pretty excited about it when it started. But then halfway through the semester, she's like, this is terrible. I hate teaching and it's, it's not for everyone. So, there's going to be times when 
you discover something new that you didn't think that you would enjoy, right? There are gonna be some folks who are really attracted to bureaucracy and paperwork and structure and order, and others that are really attracted to creativity and freedom and how can we figure out how to make this pig fly? You know, there's room for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like some, what you said was really, really important for students to understand. I think that it's really crucial for them to understand that sometimes, yes, you are going to have to work really hard to maybe find that career goal. Maybe you are going to find something that doesn't work for you. Um, and that's totally valid. I think that a lot of students are really afraid of making the wrong choice. You know, they're afraid of graduating and choosing something and then being stuck in the wrong career forever. Sure. Um, to, to hear that, you know, maybe that's just considered your, your non-choice and then you move on and you find something else. Um, and that, you know, you're not always going to find that perfect job right away after graduation, that it will take a while or that it could take a while. I think that that's, that's really helpful for students to know and to hear. Um, okay, so that was, that was a long roundabout answer for what you like best and what do you like least about what you're doing? Oh my God, the meetings. <laughs> meetings are the worst, literally the worst part of the job, mm -hmm. um, which is unfair because it's, it's really helpful to be up to date and to sort of know what's going on. But we have, um, we have these times where you have to attend meetings and you have to get additional information and, and there are just so many better ways that it probably could be delivered, but because, um, because we're used to a particular format, because we're used to one hour meeting blocks and an agenda and we're all gonna talk. And then, you know, this guy over here, again, Steve, because everyone's name is Steve, uh, my, my colleague in the department, he's gonna, he's gonna lead with this comment and he always makes the same comment before he goes off for 20 minutes on something. Okay, he made the comment, I'm just gonna strap in because I see I'm gonna be here for it. <laughs> the meetings can be really challenging. Mm -hmm. The other thing that can be pretty challenging is sometimes there are situations where a professor really can't do certain things to support their students, right? Like there's, there's a certain sort of level or a certain line that you can't and really shouldn't cross with students. So it can be really difficult when you have someone who um, otherwise could be successful, but maybe they're experiencing some personal challenges or they're experiencing, they've got, They've got something that makes it harder for them to learn, but it's not documentable. It's not a, a diagnosis or it's not an accommodation that DSS can provide. And knowing the circumstances under which you can help, but then also knowing where you have to stop, mm -hmm. right? Because no, no mystery here. Like my people like to solve problems. It's like, I will throw everything at this, but but you can't, right? And having that patience to understand that there are some times when you have to let the learner come to you and by solving everyone's problems, it's, it's really gonna be harder in the long run to let people be successful. Mm -hmm. It'll be really challenging because if you, I mean, imagine it from the perspective of the learner, and I, I'm, I would have guessed that many people watching this have been that learner. I feel like that because I was that learner, right? I was a terrible student as an undergraduate. I mean, I say that I was an honor student. I took all these credits, but I was also kind of a jerk, right? And I thought I knew everything. So at the time when I came across professors like me, and I did, I was like, what a jerk, right? Like, what? It's their job to teach me. But then to some extent, the point of the educational process is to, to also train the learner to self-advocate and that self-advocating is really hard and so if you're the faculty member in that and you're like come on self-advocate come to me make an appointment come to my office mm -hmm. and and they don't and then nobody's happy so you know recognizing the two-way street and recognizing where uh you know whose role is what in the two-way street is is really challenging especially when you know 
that the person can be successful. Like you know that it can happen and knowing where to stop, where it's professional to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard. That does sound very, very challenging. Um, all right. So <laughs> I, I want to be uh, mindful of your time. It's, we're about 10 to three here. So um, I'll just ask you one last question before we kind of wrap up. Um, so what, what do you wish you had known before um, graduation or alternately what, 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 what advice would you give to a graduating student? So there's this adage, right? There's this expression that people use sometimes and it's like, I'm not religious, so I'm going to be terrible at remembering what it is, but um, something like you have a plan and God laughed, right? As if like, this is how things are going to go. And then like the universe is like, ah, oh, fat chance, right? Mm, we'll see how that really goes. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that I wish that I had known at the time was that I just could not have perceived the ways in which my life would have changed, right? Because you're, you're at a particular, I mean, even now I'm sitting here having this conversation with you and I think to myself, you know what, I'm going to do this today and I'm going to do this next week and I'm going to do that next month, et cetera. I have a plan and I know somewhere out there the universe is laughing at me because if we were to have this same conversation in two years, I'll be like, oh, that is not what happened. Mm -hmm. But it's much harder when you're in that situation where you're about to graduate, right? So our culture puts a lot of pressure on graduation. So now you're done with college and you're an adult and you're going to go out there and you're going to be successful and everything's going to come your way. And now you have a car and a house, a two garage thing. And now you're in a success. No, not, not anymore. This isn't, this isn't your grandparents' world anymore right and so being a college graduate doesn't guarantee success nor does it require success right so just because you're graduating does not mean that you are married to or committed to the career that you trained for you may discover like I did I thought I was gonna be in group homes forever right like I'm gonna figure out how to make a group home better and there was some element of that that still works for me I'm interested in how do we get the best treatment for our clients and how do we do it through the perspective of improving the quality of services we provide, right? So I do that through educating new behavior analysts and training the ones that are currently there and addressing issues in employee performance. Like that's what I do, but it's not what I thought that I would do. And if a number of, you know, different factors hadn't come together in the perfect way at the perfect time for me, I'd be in a very different place right now. I certainly wouldn't be in Alaska, mm -hmm. right? probably still be in Kansas. I'd maybe be working in an entirely different field. So being open to the idea that a change in path does not equal failure mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing to think about. And this idea that taking time off to reorient where you are is not failure. I mean, none of them are failure. The only way you can fail is if you just give up entirely Mm -hmm. right? But even then, that can sometimes be therapeutic. That can sometimes be what's required, especially if you've just gone through a very long educational process and you've never taken any time for yourself. Maybe you need that year off to sort of figure out, where am I? Get my sea legs, see what I'm interested in. If you're in a career and you don't like the career that you're in, are you not interested in it because you don't like the career itself? Or is there something about the organization that you're with, right? Mm -hmm. Could you volunteer and get more skills on the side that could maybe put you in a better position? There are a thousand different directions you can go. The, the worst thing to do would, I think, just to, be give up, to give up. That is very, very helpful advice. I think for a lot of people, not just for graduates. Um, all right, so we're at just about an hour here. I am going to let you go and get back to your grading. Is there anything else that you didn't get a chance to say that you would like to say, or did we cover everything that you wanted to cover? Well, I'm not sure if, if NMU graduates are aware, but the NMU psychology department does have a certification in behavior analysis. So 
if you're graduating, you could become a board certified assistant behavior analyst with very few classes and improve the lives of lots of people, especially those who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities or autism. So check it out. All right. Well, thank you so much. I will make sure to actually link to the behavior analysis uh, page on enemy site so that anybody can take a look at that. Um, and thank you again so much for taking the time to be here. It was really great to talk to you and hear um, your story. And I hope to hear from you soon. All right. Thanks. Plans change. <laughs> Bye. Bye.